organizers for inviting me and honored to be asked to speak today. Um, I also appreciate the audience hanging in for a full day of uh, lectures, so I'll try to keep you entertained talking about artificial cloning in domestic animals. I'm not going to go into the history of the amphibians because I think that was already covered. I'm going to strictly limit myself to domestic animals. Now, uh, John, John's covered some of this already, but if you work in a lab that does um, crosses across multiple fields, the term clone and cloning can be um, confusing, particularly if you ask one of your students if they've done the cloning yet and you don't get straight which one you're talking about. It's because in molecular biology, it can refer to copying a piece of DNA. In cell and uh, microbiology, it's all the cells derived from an original progenitor cell. And in animal biology, I'm talking about an animal having the, the identical DNA to another individual. Now, there are a number of different ways we can do animal cloning. The most simplistic one is simple embryo splitting, in which case you can get two copies. Occasionally, you can get three copies if you, you know, further divide the embryo. But there's one uh, feature, the developmental clock. At this point in time when we're doing the embryo splitting, the cells are undergoing cleavage division. They're getting smaller. They do not grow in size before the next mitosis. So you're limited by the number of splits you can do because at a certain point, the embryo is too small, does not have enough mass um, to live, le lead to a viable embryo. And this is you know, really the most efficient is to splitting it in half. Once you go beyond that, you lose um, efficiency in getting pregnancies. The next way you can do it is by um, supplementing extra oplasmic mass by doing embryo nuclear transfer, so transferring the nucleus from a blastomere to an oocyte, reprogramming that. And in this case, you can get multiple copies. So depending on how many blastomeres are in at that stage that you're cloning. And then there's somatic cell nuclear transfer, which in theory could give you unlimited number of clones because you're using cells that you can multiply in culture, somatic cells. Now, because this was in the light of evolution, I wanted to put this a little bit in the evolutionary context. So if we're talking about embryo splitting, we basically have a green light um, because embryo splitting occurs naturally, uh, as we just heard. But if we're talking about embryo blastomer cloning, then we're beginning to run up against a few roadblocks um, because you're asking the blastomere nucleus to revert several mitotic divisions previously to where it, it is current. And there are um, changes that occur to the epigenome, which I'll be talking about in a minute, and um, changing in the gene expression profile of the blastomere. So you're asking them to revert back to the zygotic state. And so there are some blocks to that. When we talk about somatic cell nuclear transfer, um, we're really running up against a wall in some ways because we're asking, um, we're trying to overcome roadblocks that have been um, evolved over long periods of time to prevent cells from reverting back to an embryonic state, to prevent them from becoming cancerous. And also, you, know, you can think of the chaos that would occur in a multicellular organism if a kidney cell could suddenly decide it wants to become a heart cell or a pancreas cell. So there are a lot of you know, evolutionary um, evolved controls that help maintain a cell um, in its phenotype. Now, in order to understand some of this, we need to look at some um, developmental biology. So this case, it's the DNA methylation reprogramming that occurs during the mammalian life cycle. And I would like to start here with uh, gametogenesis, when you have the primordial germ cells uh, forming either sperm or uh, ogonia, depending on the um, sex of the gonads, in which case, during primordial germ cells, the methylation patterns are uh, completely erased, and a male imprint or a female imprint is reestablished. Now, when these two gametes come together, the male imprint is actively demethylated, while the female uh, is passively demethylated. And then during early embryonic development, um, the print um, methylation patterns are reestablished as appropriate for an early embryo. And then when you get into the some more somatic tissues. Now, in order to do cloning in animals, we have to use a micromanipulation setup because these embryos are much smaller than amphibians. So a mouse embryo is around 80 to 100 microns, and a bovine embryo is around 140 to 180 microns. So you can imagine 
um, even doing simple embryo splitting would, wouldn't be possible without the use of a microscope. So for somatic cell nuclear transfer, we use an inverted microscope. This has the tool holders, which are holding these uh, glass micropipettes that we fabricated, or now you can buy them from commercial companies. We have a <coughs> suction control for suction and pressure. These can be manual like this, or there are also electronic versions available. And then the joystick, which dampens your hand movement. So you can do a gross hand movement, and then that's dampened down just to a few uh, micrometers. And then we also use uh, dissecting scopes, and heat can use um, warming stages depending on the system. Now, so the easiest method is simply embryo splitting. This is uh, really relatively easy. Students do it in my experimental embryology class each year. So this is an undergraduate student who is actually using the monitor rather than the um, eyepieces in the microscope to watch her um, embryo split. And she is splitting a mouse, uh, Morila, here. And basically what it is, it's a razor blade. It's a piece of a razor blade on a, a little holder. And you just press it down and cut it in half. And if we transferred these halves to a surrogate, they have a chance of uh, each forming a new individual. So you might say, why split embryos? In this case, I'm talking about domestic animal embryos, cattle, sheep, goats. Um, one could be developmental questions. Uh, or also for research for making matched pairs so you can have a control and an experimental, which would be really great. But the driving force has really been animal production because you can imagine working with sheep, cattle, goats, it's expensive and so you need um, significant money to do this. And this is driven by the commercial genetic companies. So one is to, to gain increased uh, yield um, of embryos. So if you have um, embryos, say bovine embryos, where if you uh, transfer either an, uh, an, an intact embryo, you might say have a 70, 80% chance of achieving a pregnancy. If you cut it in half, even if you do lose some um, efficiency in establishing a pregnancy, if you get a 60% chance of pregnancy, you see you'll get more individuals produced. You could get 120 uh, out of 100 uh, embryos instead of um, 80. And also for genetic gain purposes, which is uh, well, talk more about here. In um, when you're talking about commercial production, well, one is you want the more offspring I just uh, talked about. You also want embryos of desired sex and genotype. So if you're doing a, a high-value cross between a pedigreed male and female, you can take these embryos and sex them, um, split them, and um, use the desired sex. So if you're talking about uh, heifers, uh, dairy dairy cattle. Um, you would probably want the females because you're most interested in milk production. If you're talking about beef cattle, then you might be going after the males because it would be uh, advantageous to have identical males that you could put out in the ranch land and breed your cattle, and it's the same genetics, um, which would give you increased uniformity. Uh, the other thing is you can clone hybrids, and I'm not talking about the sterile hybrids here. I'm talking about, say, F1 hybrids, which you have um, bred for superior meat production. And it also allow for rapid repopulation and dissemination of genetics. Now, when the early uh, when we uh, developed the ability to uh, transfer uh, embryo splits and do uh, embryo um, cloning in that way, the breeding geneticists were already considering what would happen if we could produce multiple clones. So this is a paper that came out in uh, 1983, um, at which time we could do embryo splitting, but not yet really um, production of a large number of clones. And um, Nicholas and Smith were proposing that if we could indeed um, produce a large number of clones, we could get great genetic gain um, faster using these. And when I'm talking about genetic gain, what we're talking about is um, incre increased um, production traits. So that might be increased milk, um, better carcass in beef cattle, things like that. So how do we do embryo? So how do we overcome this problem with the splitting? We only can get a few embryos. And as I said, we could use embryo cloning, in which case the enucleated oocyte provides sufficient mass that the donor blastomere can now um, be reprogrammed and um, lead to production of viable nuclear transfer embryos. So this process includes the enucleation, the transfer. The transfer can either be a direct injection into the ooplasm most commonly, it, the blastomere is uh, put between the zona pellucida 
and the oplasmic membrane fused to the oplast by electropulse, and then the egg is activated to continue development. And this is showing you. So this is a, a biopsy pipette. We're removing two blastomeres for use um, for cloning purposes. This is the same technique we would use if we were doing pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So you could remove these two blastomeres and then uh, use them to um, determine the sex and um, what genes this embryo contains. So here we have the blastomere next to the oocyte. And this is it fusing after receiving electrical pulse. Now for those of you who are not familiar with um, the mammalian embryos, this is the zone of Pellucida, which is a cellular um, glycoprotein matrix. It's very flexible. Um, it's relatively easy to pierce for this procedure. But there's also another way of making embryo clones um, or somatic cell nuclear transfer, and that's to use hand cl handmade cloning. Um, in this case, you remove the zone of Pellucida. And this is the ooplast, and this is the uh, blastomere to be uh, fused. And the advantage of this technique is that you don't need a micromanipulator. You can do the procedure um, just using a dissecting scope. And so using these procedures, as I say, you can, can obtain um, identical calves. So why embryo blastomere cloning? Same reasons as before for embryo splitting, developmental questions, match sets, increased yield genetic gain, but also um, market proven clones. So what are market proven clones? In this case, we would take an embryo that was obtained from a high value sire and dam. We would use the blastomeres to clone and make more clones. We would take those clones, reclone them. Uh, so we had sufficient number that we could put some back in frozen storage and we could transfer enough to get 20 daughters. And then these daughters would be tested for their production traits. So this is similar to um, when we do um, sire progeny tests where you would um, use one uh, sire semen, produce a lot of embryos, and test his daughters. But this is more direct. You're actually testing the clones themselves. So if you had a set of daughters that had superior production traits, you could go back to frozen storage, take out the clones, reclone them, and then you could market these as proven clones. So I know right now you're saying, well, I've never heard of proven clones um, going into the market from embryos. And there's a reason for that. It didn't work. Great idea, but it didn't work. So I was at a um, genetics company, American Breeders Service, um, which sells um, dairy and beef semen to uh, farmers and ranchers for improving their herds. And we were trying what we called multi-generational cloning at that time. So we would take an embryo, we would uh, clone it. So that was, this would be the first generation uh, clone. If we transferred it, we would get a 10% calving rate. Not great, but considering what we were doing, um, we were happy. If we took this first generation clone and instead did a second round of cloning and transferred it, our pregnancy rate dropped down. And we could go up past five generations of uh, recloning, but we only ever got pregnancies at the third. Then sometime later, a group in Australia repeated this. And this was after a number of improvements had been made in the cloning process. So they had hopes of you know, maybe overcoming this roadblock. Um, but you see very similar um, data. So no market proven clones. So we were wondering, well, OK, we can't really make more numbers by doing recloning. Can we make more numbers by moving a little further up in embryo development, say, to the blastocyst stage and use inner cell mass cells um, from the early embryo where we could get more cells? And the thought being is, if we could get these to work, which have undergone the first lineage differentiation from you know, blastomeres to ICM and trophectoderm, Maybe we'd be able to culture these so they're sort of like embryonic stem cells, and then we would have a really large number of cells to use. So first, we wanted to try uh, using the, the ICM cells. So this is very uh, pretty much somatic cell nuclear transfer. You can argue with me because they're embryonic cells, but still. Um, we transfer these under the zone of Pellucida to, from a nucleated oocyte, uh, fuse them, activate them, and transfer them. And this shows the process. Here we the ICM. What we did is immunosurgery. Um, so we used uh, um, antibodies which killed the outside cells, hence the red, and the inside cells, ICM cells, survived, and used these in nuclear transfer. 
and, and did obtain uh, calves. Now this is interesting at the time in that um, our uh, competitors at another uh, commercial company were actually doing the same thing um, that we were doing. We didn't know it at the time because it was all very hush-hush. Um, we, we obtained very similar results using ICM-derived clones. Uh, we obtained 23, 27%. Similar uh, calving rate, 13 to 15 percent. Um, I don't know what their survival rate was because this company folded at this time. Uh, we had two calves survive. So this is a good point to mention that one of the issues that you always hear about animal cloning is that there are um, gestational losses and that the uh, offspring don't always thrive after being born. Well, this is not just a case of um, using adult cells, somatic cell. Um, cloning. It also uh, occurs when we use the embryonic cells, the ICM cells, and we actually um, saw this, what we call the large calf syndrome, because the calves quite often are, the ones that don't survive are quite often significantly larger than um, their other clones that do. Um, we saw this also in embryo cloning. So it's not just a feature of using somatic cells. So we uh, showed that we could use ICM cells. So this uh, led us to the next step of saying, well, maybe if we grow the embryonic and fetal cells in culture, we'll have an unlimited number of cells. Can we use these in uh, cloning? And this is all bovine that I'm talking about now. And indeed, uh, we did. We obtained uh, pregnancies where we had apparently normal fetus. And um, I can't vouch for it myself, but the uh, pathologist people tell us this is a normal bovine fetus there. So we obtained normal, normal bovine fetuses using um, these cultured cells, but we would never got any live calves. They would always fail fairly early in the gestation due to issues with placentation. So these would be grossly abnormal placentas. About the same time period, uh, Keith Campbell over in the Roslyn Institute was studying cell cycle synchronization between the donor cell and the oocyte. So there are three different ways of doing um, somatic cell nuclear transfer. You can transfer the cell uh, to the oocyte and fuse it, then activate the oocyte and allow it to develop. You can do your electrofusion and your activation or your transfer and activation at the same time. Or you can do the activation <coughs> before you do the transfer and electrofusion. Now when I'm saying activation, normally when you fertilize an egg, the sperm activates the oocyte and um, this triggers the embryo to enter into normal pre-implantation embryonic development. Different species are easier or harder to uh, artificially activate, but they all require this activation. And it involves stimulating calcium oscillations, calcium spikes in, in the oocyte. Um, so Keith showed that what he called the universal recipient, if you activated it before you transferred, he got better success. Uh, currently, I think most people still use the fusion before activation because we have learned how to inhibit um, the histone kinases that would cause premature condensation of the chromosomes and damage the chromosomes, and we found better ways of activating the oocyte. So this is actually easier logistically than um, having a shorter time frame to work when you have the pre-activation. And so using um, those techniques, the Roslyn group were able to obtain sheep um, using long-term cultured embryonic cells. And this was published a year before Dolly. Um, those of us working in the embryo cloning world were really excited by this because it showed that we could have an unlimited source of cells for cloning. And we weren't particularly concerned that this had to be embryonic cells. Um, but then the next year came the report of Dolly, which surprised a lot of people, maybe less so to those who are already working in the field. But it, you know, it break broke dogma that no adult cells couldn't be used. Because now we know that adult cells can be used. Um, Dolly was a, a highly controversial for a number of different reasons. One, the ethics of cloning. Two, the number of lost uh, pregnancies. But most of these were actually very early gestational. Um, well, most of the losses, because people talk about 270 some embryos being produced, most of those were never transferred because they didn't develop sufficiently. So it's, it was about a tenth of those were actually transferred. Um, and some people were implied that perhaps um, Dolly was derived from stem cells that had been uh, cultured. But subsequent uh, studies in large animals have shown that um, it's not necessarily a stem cell source, but um, you can reprogram 
a differentiated somatic cell. So the, the work that all instigated this um, actually started in the late 70s and, and early 80s by Steen Willinson, who was doing the embryo splitting work. Okay, this is um, you know, several decades after the amphibian work, and the, ration, the reason for that is that we didn't have the culture systems for growing domestic species. Um, or the ability, in some cases, to um, synchronize the recipients or stimulate the ovaries to get a large number of oocytes. There are a number of reproductive techniques that needed to be developed and improved before we could do this sort of work in mammalian embryos. So Steen Willidson showed that embryo splitting could be done. Um, he showed that embryo cloning could be done in the late um, 1980s. And this was also demonstrated in cattle. And, and then came the uh, seminal work from um, Ian Wilmot's group with uh, the cell cycle synchronization, allowing the production of um, Morag and uh, Megan and, and Dolly, showing that fetal and adult somatic cell nuclear transfer indeed was feasible. And this was followed up very quickly um, by showing that cattle could also be cloned. So very shortly after these, then we see an increase in the number of species that people attempt, so goat and pig, cat, horse, dog, and more recently, camel. And as John said, there's over 20 species that have been cloned. So with the um, interest in uh, cloning after pr production of Dolly, we saw a really dramatic increase in the number of articles that are being published on somatic cell nuclear transfer. So what do these, um, what are these articles about? What are they studying? Well, one is propagation of genetics. That was the original concern for the commercial companies to be able to produce superior genetics. So this propagation of genetics could be either for the conservation of species or if you have a favored uh, long-horned uh, steer uh, that you know, breaks all records, you can um, replicate him. Also used in applied research and development, biofarming, which I'll talk about a little more, and in, in basic research. So in the propagation of genetics, the, what are some of the uses? You can produce fertile clones from um, geldings and steers. So of course, gelding and steer you know, cannot reproduce. Um, if you have a, a one that you want to you know, show superior genetics, what do you do? Now you can take adult tissues and clone that animal and have a, a fertile clone. You can extend the reproductive uh, life of an aging sire or dam. So you, let's say you have um, a cow or a bull that is passing on superior genetics. People are still interested in getting offspring from that animal. You can clone that animal and renew its um, productive capabilities. You can replace a lost sire or dam if you, you know, had the foresight to save some of the cells. And you can propagate hybrids. So this would either be F1 hybrids that you've crossed for superior meat production, or it could be, even be um, sterile hybrids such as racing mules. And racing mules were one of the first um, animals to be cloned after the you know, traditional cattle, sheep, and goats. You can use it to improve herd genetics. You can have proven clones and ensure uniformity of product. And one of the interesting things here with the uniformity of product, there have been studies where people look at meat carcasses at the slaughterhouse, decide that they have a superior carcass, taken cells from the carcass and use them in cloning to obtain the genetics. So you might say, well, how much is it, does it cost to clone an animal? Because one of the things in commercial production, everything has you have this cost-benefit analysis you must do. Because if it costs more to do the cloning than the benefit you reap from it, then you're not going to do it in a commercial situation. So the costs range from roughly 20000 in cattle to uh, hundred and uh, 50,000 in horse. Uh, there is a company that's actually doing commercial cloning, Viagen. Um, well, uh, yeah, Viagen. Um, they will clone cattle, horse, goat, sheep, pigs. If you want your dog cloned, they will put you in contact with a Korean company that is cloning dogs. I don't know if anybody is actually commercially cloning cats at this time point. Okay. Now, the one that I'm most interested in, the one I worked most in, was the applied uh, uh, research and development using transgenics to produce biopharmaceuticals. So real advantages to use in somatic cell nuclear transfer in this application is because you can take the cells, transfect them in culture, characterize them in depth to be sure that they have copy number 
where the gene is integrated within gene is intact. And you can use that in somatic cell nuclear transfer, producing a transgenic embryo and transferring that and getting a transgenic offspring. Now, the advantages to transgenic somatic cell nuclear transfer is it's, you're not limited by species. Previously, if you wanted to make a transgenic animal, you either had to do pronuclear or microinjection, which has different efficiencies in different species. Some species, it's very inefficient. And embryonic stem cells. And embryonic stem cells for transgenics really only exist in mice and now rodents. The other advantage is if you do your characterization of your donor cells correctly, you're pretty much guaranteed expression of the transgene, which you're not with uh, pronuclear microinjection. And um, it's been shown that these transgenic uh, animals transmit the transgene to their offspring. So what are the logistics of doing somatic cell nuclear transfer for transgenic production? Well, uh, it's a little complicated, so I'll break it down. First, you want to find a genetically valuable animal, because if you're producing a biopharmaceutical in milk, you want an animal that makes lots of milk. You don't want to start off with a bad milk production. So you take uh, cells from a superior animal, culture them, transfect them, select them to be sure that you have integration of the transgene, the copy number that you would like to have. Then you take uh, oocyte. Generally, it's an immature oocyte. Uh, these are matured overnight. Once they're matured, which means the metaphase plate is now near the edge of the ooplast, you can aspirate that out, do your cell transfer, your electrofusion, activation, and transfer it into a surrogate and obtain uh, offspring. So how have these been applied in biofarming? Well, it's been used to make spider silk um, in milk. We took dragline gene um, from a spider and um, transfected goat uh, fetal cells with that and used that to make uh, goats, which did indeed produce spider silk in their milk. Um, it's also been used to make blood uh, factors. In fact, the first uh, product that's been approved for use as a human um, therapeutic has been produced in goats, that, um, and this is antithrombin. Monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies have been produced, and butylcholinesterase, which is a nerve toxin, have been produced um, very successfully in the milk of transgenic animals. And this is predominantly in goat for a number of uh, reasons. People have also made uh, uh, animals, both sheep, goat, cows, that have altered production traits, excuse me, also pig. So this includes uh, prion knockout or knockdown, so these animals would not be able to get mad cow's disease. In fact, one company has used this prion knockout in cattle because they're producing human polyclonal antibodies in the cattle. And so you wouldn't want to have the problem of uh, worrying about prions. Um, altered fatty acid composition in pigs, altered milk in goat, pig, and cattle, and altered phosphorus secretion in pigs. So the phytase pigs were able to utilize uh, phosphorus much more efficiently, so they excreted less phosphorus in their, wa in their waste. It's also a vital tool in regenerative medicine and, and biomedical research. So using domestic animals, people have looked at the potential for doing patient-specific repair, in this case looking at um, kidney, making new kidneys. Um, in spinal cord, cord repair, um, using uh, neural stem cells to uh, repair the spinal cord in, in pigs. In this case, what they did is they made cloned pigs, so they, their experimental and their control groups um, had the same genotype. Xenotransplantation, so in this case, they're altering the pig such that the heart is more compatible with um, human so that it's not rejected upon transplantation. And it's also, uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer has also been used to establish medical models for such things as cystic fibrosis, diabetes, and retinal pigmentosis, among a large number of others. So somatic cell nuclear transfer really has a number of advantages for these uh, this research. But it's also been used just for some basic research, que research questions. In this case, um, an Italian group, uh, Galli's uh, lab in Italy, took oocytes from a mare, took donor cells from the same mare, and transferred these um, back into the mare, and she gave birth to her own clone. And the question they were asking was, does the embryo need to be genetically distinct from the dam? Because there have been a number of theories saying that there has to be um, 
genetic differences so that the placenta will accept the, uh, the invasion of this individual. We've also used it uh, to answer questions regarding gene function. You can't really see very well because of the overhead light here. But in this case, we have the nanog promoter um, linked to a GFP reporter gene. It's because we're studying the, the nanog gene um, regulation during early embryonic development. It's also the just basic research into the cloning process itself. So how does uh, SCNT work? And, um, why does it go wrong? How does the oocyte reprogram the somatic cell uh, nucleus? Uh, what epigenetic remodeling factors are involved? How can, and how can we improve the cloning efficiencies? Because let's say, somatic cell nuclear transfer works, but most of the time it doesn't. So this is a study, um, well, it's a collection of studies. One is from uh, Bob Wall's group at the USDA, where they were asking the question about does it matter um, which which fetus we use, because there has been some evidence that different cell lines have different cloning efficiencies. And so as you see here, with the initial transfer of the blastocyst into the cattle, you get a relatively decent pregnancy rate running from 40 to 60 percent, but you see a really sharp drop off by 60 days. So early gestational loss is the, is the biggest issue here. And even then, you have a, a slow, um, you know, continuing loss of um, the pregnancies until you end up with, you know, basically a, a five to uh, ten percent calving rate. Now, with some improvements, in this case, it's a group in New Zealand. Um, the green dots, excuse me, uh, were using um, well synchronized donor cells and the oocyte and careful selection of the embryos they transferred, and you see they saw less gestational loss. And in the goats we typically would not see much of this gestational loss. Um, so the question is, you know, why goats are better than cows? And nobody's really answered that one yet. So what are the technical challenges to somatic cell nuclear transfer? Well, one, it's very labor intensive. Because okay? you're manually manipulating the, the oocytes, nucleating, doing the transfer, doing the cell fusion, um, checking for fusion, and then activating the oocyte. So it, it's, a, it's a long day, done best by um, groups that are well-knit. Um, donor cell selection, not only you know, from which individual you derive the donor, because we have seen some um, suggestions that the genotype of the donor cell is important, but also how you process the cell when you're collecting it is important. Um, characterizing it, particularly if you're doing transgenics, and then some studies have looked at whether we can reprogram the, the cell before you use it, or at least assist the oocyte in reprogramming the cell before you use it in somatic cell nuclear transfer. The recipient oocyte potential, the recipient oocyte is basically a black box. We, you know, we really can't, it's really hard to pick out which is going to be the viable oocyte. There are a number of studies that are looking into this. Um, but not all, oocy all oocytes are equal. And then, of course, there's just various procedural information, uh, inefficiencies, as you can imagine. If this is pretty much all done manually. So the result is we have the low initial pregnancy rates and the gestational and neonatal loss. Now, one of the um, factors involved in these gestational loss and neonatal loss is that we're trying to reprogram, we're asking the oocyte to reprogram a somatic cell nucleus back to the zygotic state. And there's all these different levels of epigenetic controls that are used to be ensure that you know, a kidney cell makes kidney proteins and does kidney function, and heart cell is a heart cell. So we're trying to fight these um, epigenetic controls by erasing them and resetting them to the zygotic stage simply by putting them into an oocyte. And this is not what the oocyte has evolved to do. It's evolved to reset a sperm nucleus not a somatic cell nucleus. Now, there have been a lot of studies looking at this, and the only one I can say that seems to be consistent is they've shown that histone deucellase inhibitors can assist in somatic cell nuclear uh, reprogramming. And this is mostly when you apply it to the embryo and not necessarily to the cell ahead of time. But much of this work is um, conflicting and contradictory and not really done with large enough numbers of embryos and most of it lacks um, embryo transfers. 
But really, the take-home message here is that you know, somatic cell nuclear transfer does work, and that alone is amazing. We, when it works and you obtain a, a lamb or a calf or a, you know, goat mice, um, these animals which survive, of course I have to put that caveat in, do uh, undergo normal sexual maturation. They produce normal and viable gametes, and these gametes produce normal offspring. And um, perhaps even you know, more critically here is these, these offspring in, in these gametes have normal epigenetic um, patterns, whereas some of the clones themselves can have slight modifications in the epigenetic pattern. Those that survive tend to be more normal, of course, than those that don't survive. And then if you're interested in for commercial reasons, um, it's several studies have, uh, well, numerous studies have um, been done to look at the milk and the meat, and it's been shown to be safe to eat. In fact, the, the government regulatory agencies in the US, in Europe, and in Japan have all said that the milk and meat of clones um, are safe to eat. Of course, we're talking about the non-transgenic ones. Um, transgenics would be another whole bar pike. So with, with that, I'd you know, like to answer any questions you have about somatic cell nuclear transfer. Um, this is a, a set of clones that are produced um, from, I think these were the adult fibroblast cells. And they, all, they were born about the same time, and they all ran together, um, whether it's because they all were born at the same time and played with each other, or because they're clones, I'm not really quite sure. Thank you.